cryptids, unsolved mysteries, megalithic structures, extraterrestrials, interdimensional portals, time skips, and more. Don't change that channel, because now you are leaving the mainstream and entering into the fringe. Greetings, greetings, followers. It is I, Cardinal Sin. And today we have a very special guest, Mr. Micah Hanks. And I will read his bio for you. With more than a decade in podcasting, travel, writing, and research, and the study of history and science, Micah Hanks has more than just a passion for knowledge. His study of world history culture and philosophy over the years have helped shape his nonpartisan outlook on current events and always with a nod to the lessons that history can teach us. Micah is a longtime advocate for scientific research into unidentified aerial phenomena, more commonly known as UFOs. He is a contributing member of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, as well as a frequent commentator and writer on the subject and maintains an interest in history and possible scientific explanations for aspects of the phenomenon. You can learn some of Micah's UAP research at his uh, website, micahanks.com, and his other in uh, interests include space studies, zoological mysteries, and unusual phenomena in nature. A hopeful skeptic, he advocates a critically minded approach to the study of these subjects. And be sure to visit Micah's blog for more of his writing, research, and ideas. In 2020, Micah launched The Debrief with journalists Tim McMillan and M.J. Benias, a new site and media enterprise which examines science and disruptive technology. The Debrief has closely followed developments related to the U.S. government's collection and evaluation of information related to UAP. After several years as a producer for iHeartMedia, Micah began podcasting in 2011. He has interviewed a number of experts over the years in the fields of science, technology, philosophy, history, archaeology, and other disciplines. In 2016, Hanks began working closely with the archaeological community in the, in the southeastern United States in an effort to understand relationships between early North Americans and their environment at the end of the last ice age. This led to the co-founding of the Seven Ages Research Associates, and in 2018 he and the team produced a short documentary on the controversial Topper archaeology site in Allendale County, South Carolina. Micah is a frequent guest on podcasts and radio programs and has been interviewed by Vice, Forbes, Investigation Discovery, CNN Radio, Coast to Coast, AM, Hot Air, and a number of other outlets. He has also lectured in America and Europe on a variety of subjects that include archaeology, unidentified flying objects, and historical mysteries. And for our surprise guest, Walter Bosley is an investigator of historical occult mysteries, author of pulp fiction novels, and a screenwriter who has appeared on the History Channel's Ancient Aliens. After 19 years in national security, Walter Bosley is a licensed private investigator in California, where he also runs his small press publishing company, Lost Continent Library, founded in 2002, enjoying its 20th anniversary year in 2022. Bosley has traveled much of the world, both on the job and off, including trips through Mexico and South America with David Hatcher Childress. Walter Bosley was born in San Diego, California, and attended SDSU, where he earned a BA in journalism. He has been employed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and is an inactive reserve officer in the U.S. Air Force, for which he served as a special agent of the AFOSI while on active duty and then worked as a counterterrorism operational consultant for six years following military service. Bosley spends his time writing fiction and nonfiction, as well as investigative strange mysteries, in between PI assignments. 
The latest news about Bosley's projects can be found at empireofthewheel.blogspot.com and lostcontinentlibrary.blogspot.com. Walter Bosley, Micah Hanks, welcome back to Into the Fringe. Hey, Good to see you guys. Yeah, Walter Bosley. Yeah. It's been far too soon. I mean, far too yeah. long. <laughs> we meet again. <laughs> you were you were in more exotic locales last time we talked a couple weeks back. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. get there. We'll get there. Yeah, we're headed we that way, aren't we? We always are. Story. We don't want to um, story the surprise. We don't want to spoil the surprise. Um. So uh, normally, uh, at this point, what we would do is uh, Walter and I would pour up uh, in our. Um, special uh, tiki mugs but uh, since Walter is house sitting he doesn't have his and I was thinking about starting with the Crypt Keeper <laughs> oh cool I like that one but instead yeah. I decided to go with the Gorn you got one I got one. Oh, when did you get I it I thought that they were sold out oh excellent so you'll pardon me while I pour up this is just a, a ginger ale. We're going to have to pair up on the pour up definitely in the future oh, yeah. with, the, with our gorns. Yes, indeed. I'll have to obtain one of these gorns. For the time being, I merely have my uh, Yeti full of tea here. Oh, so. a Yeti. Okay. Yes. Well, I got my Hellboy mug with tea. Let me see your Yeti. What's in my Yeti? I've got a little bit of tea this evening oh, that I'm I doing. See. It's a just not like the chamomile yummy. kind. If I do that too early, it puts me right down, and I have to try and energize <laughs> a little. So it's it's good old uh, black Irish tea tonight instead. <laughs> I love ginger ale. I do too, oh, yeah. actually. It's uh, Canada Dry is the only ginger ale on the market that actually still has real ginger in it. Really? Yeah, of the of the major brands, you're right. There there are those obscure brands that you can get at the coffee joints that are really incredible. Yeah. That have ginger in them. Um and I can never remember the names. <laughs> so let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh Micah, you've been in South America for seventeen years. Well, it seems that long anyway. Mm -hmm. What did you discover there and what led to your going there in the first place? <laughs> well, uh, I was uh, actually invited to uh, the wonderful southern extremities of South America, well, at least South Brazil, uh, by the mysterious Dr. Rafaela Krasinski, uh, who is, um, among other things, very well connected in the UFO community down there, uh, more about which uh, we will discuss here in a moment. So a quick shout out to the mysterious doctor. But uh, I had always wanted to go to Brazil and this was actually something that went back to my uh, archaeological interests. I had a TV show reach out to me <clears throat> a few years back, and they had actually uh, inquired about whether I would be interested in going and filming for about six, like I think it was going to be about six weeks down in a, in a remote portion of Brazil. And the, the TV show was going to be geared around the infamous lost city of Z, uh, which... Uh, Again, according to legend, and, and this had been one of the, the pursuits of the late Percy uh, Fawcett, I believe. He, he had actually vanished in pursuit of this. But, and there was a book that was also written about this a few years ago. But uh, the, uh, the story had been that there was a ancient, uh, you know, some kind of a, you know, a city that had been out in the, in, in the Brazilian jungles. And he believed that he had located it and knew where this was and took a very small team of he, his son, and one other individual, and they went in pursuit of this. Now, the real archaeology comes in in terms of what uh, this television program was attempting to do. They were looking at an actual excavation site, and they wanted somebody who could come down and essentially be a, you know, a commentator and who could work with more than being an archaeologist. Keep in mind, I don't have any actual uh, uh, expertise as an archaeologist. I have field experience assisting archaeologists as an avocationalist, uh, you know, volunteering on dig sites uh, in the southeast and, of course, interviewing a lot of them. So what? You're kind of a science communicator. Sort of, and, and I think that had been the gist of it. They, they had said, you know, you seem like someone who we could have come down uh, and you could talk with archaeologists and help communicate what is being found for this mysterious discovery. Well, unfortunately, I couldn't take out the six weeks of going and living in the jungle to do this, <laughs> that this project would have entailed. It sounded like a lot of fun. 
but I always thought it would really be great to uh, to spend more time in Brazil. And so, you know, the, the long term project has been uh, learn Spanish, learn Brazilian Portuguese, and then you could just about go anywhere in South America and you know speak the languages. Lo and behold, uh, I it's it's funny how things tend to kind of pile up synchronistically. In 2019, a friend invited me to go with her to. Uh, Portugal. She was thinking about moving there at the time, and she just didn't want to go to Portugal by herself. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to go to Portugal, I'm going to do it Bosley style. I'm going to start, you know, learning everything. And so I start doing all the historical <laughs> research, you know, the whole nine yards. And uh, I, I got uh, a, uh, well, what was his name? Um, Steve, oh gosh, his name slips my mind, but he does the travel log series and everything. And so I got one of his travel guides where he has some of the um, you know, the, the, the basic language for if you're going to go into like shops, restaurants, you know, how to know uh, how to navigate in streets and things like that. I just started kind of right there memorizing oh, general. Oh, por favor. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I, I just started memorizing terms. It's but, Rick Steves. Rick Steves, that's it. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly who it is, Walter. Yeah. So, yeah, I got, yeah, and, and the funny thing is, is a friend had actually passed that along to me. So it just began kind of as like, a, oh, this will be fun. But after I began to kind of pick up the language while I was there for a few weeks, I was like, you know, actually, I think I'm going to keep at this in the event that I ever head to South America. So then as things came together the following year during COVID, we were all in lockdown. Um, but that's where I made the contact with the mysterious Dr. Krasinski down there in uh, Brazil. Uh, and now, of course, I've got a lot of friends in Brazil. Now, the interesting thing is, is that when I was first invited down, I thought it might be more like, oh, we'll do, you know, do some archaeological kind of stuff. But lo and behold, uh, we ended up a, a group of us going into the Chapada dos Viaderos, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This was last September. And um, if, you know, many would think, you know, okay, this is probably like the Brazilian jungles. It, it certainly at, at certain locations has an almost tropical appearance, but really it's more almost like, uh, for instance, um, we might say that uh, Sonora or, or maybe, uh, you know, a place like uh, Sedona, you know, if, if you go out into the American Southwest, the Chapada has more of that kind of an appearance. And much like towns like Sedona or even Roswell and their kind of E.T. culture that's been built around those places, a lot of these places that, you know, Walter has written about, uh, the Chapada has the very same vibe. I mean, I was very, I had no idea about this before I went. Uh, this trip had been planned, and as an afterthought, I was invited to go along with uh, several wonderful individuals. And when we get out there to Alto Parizo, the nearest town to where we were staying in the Chapada, there's a, a restaurant called Area 51. There's a Flying Saucer Hotel. I mean, oh, it's wow. all over the place. And so I immediately began to dig into the local legends and the stories that had been published in the Hevista uh, UFO, which is the, uh, the uh, Latin American, one of the largest uh, publications in South America, but it is Brazil's UFO magazine. Uh, longtime publisher, A.J. Givard, uh, is the curator of all that information and, of course, as it turns out, uh, talking with Dr. Krasinski, she said, oh, I know AJ. I'll introduce you to him. And so she did. Um, we didn't get to meet during that first trip, but this most recent uh, expedition down there, uh, I certainly got to spend some time with AJ. And here again, the synchronicities. I arrived. I told AJ I'm in town. And he says, oh, you arrived just in time. Be my special guest. We're holding the 25th Annual Brazilian UFO Congress this weekend. The awesome. weekend that I arrived. I had no idea before I went. <laughs> cool. So, cool so I get that? to go down there, uh, caught a remarkable expect, uh, a, a presentation on this Virginia case, which is kind of the focus of James Fox's forthcoming documentary. Um, a lot of other high-profile Brazilian cases, too. And additionally, we, we caught up with AJ a few days later and had a much lengthier conversation about all things ufological. Um, such a wealth of knowledge, that guy. But the big takeaway is essentially this. Um, there is a tremendously rich... Uh, history of involvement with that topic. Uh, and the Brazilians uh, have, you know, as much richness in terms of the history and their relationship to it, and also in terms of their, you know, current interest. Um, just a case in point is a bit of an afterthought. While we were down there, it so happens, you know, there's all this talk right now about how next Tuesday, uh, Representative Andre Carson from Illinois has arranged for there to be UFO, uh, UFO hearings uh, before Congress for the first time in close to half a century. Oh, I have uh, heard that's that. That's happening here stateside. And although we reported this at the debrief while I was down there, it, of course, didn't make the, quite the same splash here in the United States. But it was a big deal down there in Brazil, the story that broke in which we reported. The Brazilian Senate just passed a requirement for similar hearings in Brazil. 
So it's kind of fascinating to me that the Brazilians and their Senate actually beat us to the punch, although the hearings won't be held until June. Uh, they certainly passed the requirement for those hearings weeks ago. The U.S. is just now getting caught up, but our hearings are going to be held next Tuesday. So there's a lot of interesting parallel, really, between the U.S. and Brazil uh, and, and you know, the attitudes toward the, the ongoing UAP mystery. So it's really been a fascinating last few weeks. I was there about two months. Glad to be back, but you always miss the wonderful things you leave behind. Yeah. And I'm sure that Walter has uh, at least something to kick in about the uh, the lost city of Z. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, anybody who anybody who's interested in that stuff knows the Fawcett story. And uh, I I what, disagree. What is the Fawcett with, story, Walter? What 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 is it? Um, yeah. It's essentially what Micah laid out was. Uh, Colonel Percy Fawcett had uh, ha had been a British Army um, surveyor who had been um, put in the position to survey the border between um, Paraguay and Uruguay and Brazil in there as well, because in the early part of the 20th century, they were fighting a war over that. And that really fascinated him with the mysteries and the history of uh, South America, specifically the Mato Grosso jungle. And, um, you know, eventually by, I think it was 1925 is when he disappeared, if I'm getting yeah, that somewhere. year right. Yeah. And uh, he came to believe that there was this lost city of this lost civilization. And um, I, of course, uh, wrote about the connection between what Richard Francis Burton had um, explored while down there and the big mystery you know that there's a big six month chunk of his uh life missing while he was in the jungle the very area and i showed the the connections between Fawcett and uh the the um manuscript 512 which okay. is a really interesting story but um as far as the book the lost city of z by david gran mm -hmm. which the recent film by the way if you haven't seen the film with charlie hunnam and Robert Pattinson, it, it's a really good film. And I disagreed with Grant. Grant, to me, took the anthropologist's cop out. <laughs> it was, oh, it was just a, you know, a local tribe, and it was he was exaggerating things. That, no, I, I think there's ancient ruins down there, and I think that's what um, uh, 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 Fawcett was talking about. But um, the nice thing about the film, if people aren't familiar with the basic story, watch that film. It's streaming on Amazon and elsewhere. And it's a very What's good movie. And, and I like the fact that they end it ambiguously. If you're a fan of the mystical side of it, ooh, it was lost in a city, they don't disappoint you. If you're a fan of the anthropological view, you'll be satisfied too. They just kind of don't go there. And, you know, and what's it direct. called on, on uh, Amazon again? Uh, it's uh, Lost City of Z. Yeah, same oh, okay. as Graham's book. Yeah, they keep it simple. You know, and I'll just uh, jump in there too, Walter. I'm kind of like you. I mean, I I think that there are uh, compelling cases that could be made for the existence of archaeological ruins that remain undiscovered. Uh, many would say, oh, come on now. You know, with all of our satellite technology, there's no way we would have missed that. But keep in mind, just a few years ago, uh, LIDAR technology, which mm -hmm. is also a satellite technology, but they were able to find that, you know, where they thought there were fairly localized ruins, I believe in parts of Guatemala and other parts of Central America, mm -hmm. LIDAR actually revealed that beneath the actual overgrowth within the jungles, yeah. the structural remains that were not visible entirely from pure satellite imagery were sprawling throughout the jungle. And I mean, yeah. archaeologists were taken quite off uh, guard by the level of, uh, or the extent of these ruins and how wide stretching they were. And they said, you know, this was really one of those big, uh, you know, op eye openers for, and what I love um, about this is an outgrowth from it was what's now being called space archaeology. There are archaeologists uh, yeah. who are using satellite and LIDAR imagery. Uh, Another great example was just a few years ago, my uh, colleague Jason Pintrail and I, we went to the Southeastern uh, Archaeology Society annual meeting in February, and there was a great presentation that our uh, friend, uh, uh, Professor Chris uh, Moore, who's one of the best archaeologists in South uh, Carolina, and uh, <clears throat> he, had, uh, he had shown that LIDAR imagery has similarly revealed uh, circular remains of, of essentially habitation sites along the coastlines 
that otherwise wouldn't have been seen, but what they're discovering, the circles are left by the abundance of shells that were cast around the outskirts of the actual habitation areas. And these, of course, were coastal. Yeah, these were coastal dwellers, so they were collecting shells. And then, of course, they were tossing the oyster shells and, you know, clam shells and things off. And a lot of the time that would end up being buried. So on the surface, if you don't know what you're looking for, you might not necessarily see it. But right. the LiDAR images kept turning up these ring-shaped features, and they went and investigated some of them. And sure enough, they found archaeological remains there. So case in point, the idea that there may be structural remains again people always think something on the you know the scale of teotihuacan you know some huge pyramid some lost city and there's still people there with advanced technology you know yeah, it may not have been that you know that elaborate but certainly it may be uh, yet the case that there will be archaeological ruins that are revealed with these kinds of technologies and it would be fascinating if if Fawcett was vindicated after all these years wouldn't oh, it? sure yeah absolutely and uh, the last i read they think that the uh that the, the, what the lidar has found in South America, uh, the last I read, that they think it might be the biggest megalopolis in the world, or it would have been uh, as far as the sprawl yeah. that we're talking about. That it's it, incredible. It's just, it was massive, which kind of um, uh, you know affects the 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 the, the, the common assumption that civilization began in Sumeria. There are many scholars who are saying, no, they got that backwards in some instances. It might be that it started in what we call the Americas and then... Uh, and of course, we all know that civilization actually started in Cimmeria, where Conan the Barbarian... Cimmeria, oh, yeah. that's right. That's, that's right. They got, it's the wrong Sumeria. It should be Cimmeria, right? <laughs> Micah, is this LIDAR technology the same uh, satellite technology that was used to discover these, these huge ancient impact craters? Uh, it certainly has revealed some impact craters, and I think that LIDAR might have actually helped the Norwegian team a, a couple of years ago in, in discerning an impact feature, uh, at, you know, what's known as the Hiawatha Crater on the Greenland Ice Sheet, which some have pointed to as a possible suspect in the ongoing search for an impact feature that's associated with the so-called uh, Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, which again, it's still a hypothesis at this point, but there's more and more compelling data in the form of uh, climate proxy data and other kinds of data, um, paleogeological data, all kinds of things, it's, some archaeological gaining, data also. Um, I'm sorry? It, it's gaining credibility. It is, yeah, and it was once considered completely fringe, you know, nonsense. But now there have been numerous science papers. Chris Moore, the aforementioned archaeologist, a friend of mine, he is one of the co-authors on many of those. He was actually the uh, scientist who identified the platinum anomaly in several of these sites and one of the sites i volunteered on in south carolina the seven ages team and i uh is the uh white pond uh archaeological site and it's again it dates back to the pleistocene it would have been you know contemporary with what we would identify as the clovis culture and possibly earlier um but there have been uh, pollen uh samples that have been uh, re uh recovered in some of the core uh taken from the sediment cores at the bottom of this lake which is a great way of gauging uh, history and changes over time because, you know, basically debris settles on the top of a lake and gradually settles to the bottom and stratigraphically those layers are preserved at the bottom of that lake in case within water and, you know, this is a natural lake so it's been there for, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of years and sure enough we've got climate data going back all the way to the Pleistocene, essentially just the last ice age. Wow. And, you know, they see from the pollen, they see from um, both the uh, the actual uh, land-based cores where you don't have maybe quite the nuanced representation that you get from the cores at the bottom of the pond, but nonetheless, you know, you find on land also archaeological evidence. We found a beautiful Dalton point, which is a about a 9,000-year-old, look at my chart here, about a 9,000-so-year-old, maybe actually going back to about 10 or 11, really. Um, this is a transitional point type, but the bottom line is we have plenty of evidence that shows what was happening, who was there around that time, and we have this abundance of platinum that appears in this certain geological strata. Platinum being a rare earth element, uh, one mechanism that it can appear in abundance in a singular strata layer like that can be a meteorite, an impact along these lines. And that's exactly what the Alvarez, uh, you know, father and son team uh, identified at the Chicxulub crater uh, there at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, which we now recognize as the impact event that decimated the dinosaurs 65 right. million years ago or so. So, Again, on a much smaller scale, these scientists have said there is abundant proxy 
data that supports the idea that something on a smaller scale but similar and that's still would have led to widespread megafaunal extinctions or at very least, you know, die offs and also other changes to the climate that that happened around 13,000 years ago, maybe 12,700 actually to be a little more precise, but, and that's the younger driest impact hypothesis. So long story short, yes, LIDAR has helped reveal possible impact features, including one that uh, is, is existent is still on the Greenland ice sheet where they have evidence of melting and fresh, Holocene ice accumulation directly over the actual impact feature. And they think it's possible that that could be a qualifier for the impact in question. Mm. Cool. I, I just want to take a minute and uh, acknowledge everybody that's in the chat so far, because we have quite a few folks here. We have Gap Stargate, Hale, and he's got all your stuff in here, Micah. Uh, Cosmic Squirrel is here. Hail. Rui is here. Good to see you. Nemo Nero is here. Hail. The lovely Sherry is here. Always nice to have the lovely Sherry in the house. Darius Munchausen is here. Hail. Ari is here. And he says, Hail Sinners. Herc130 is here. And that means pretty soon he's going to be saying, Hello, Jenny, in reference to my Jenny Agater poster. Um, oh, that's who that is. Yeah, everyone thinks it's it's Princess Leia. Uh, I, that's, I admit, I thought, but as soon as you said Jenny Agater, I instantly loved oh, it. Yeah. Although there is a striking resemblance to Leia Organa. So yeah, I, right. I suppose. As I thought if also. You haven't seen, you know, Logan's run 74 times like I have. <laughs> uh, Brian Hepburn is here. Hello. Good to see you, Brian. Scogli Jotun is here, who is a previous winner of things uh, that we do uh, as giveaways here on Into the Fringe. Uh, Ari asks, does Micah or Walter, for that matter, have any experience with the Sitacha or any archaeological evidence regarding the ancient race of giants in North America? For me, just the stories. But Micah, you might have dug into that a little more. I have. It's it's a strangely uh, contentious uh, story. <clears throat> you know, uh, the, the general idea on that one, just to kind of uh, frame the narrative, is that um, the the legend among the uh, Paiutes, uh, specifically uh, in relation to Lovelock Cave in Nevada, they they have a tradition about a, a race of you know, large individuals that they were at war with, and the name that they gave them in their traditions was the Siteka. And the story goes that uh, the Siteka would, you know, fight with them, and they had all these kinds of, you know, ongoing conflicts. And eventually, the, the Paiutes drove the remaining Siteka into Lovelock Cave, and they say that they lit a fire at the mouth of the cave and smoked them out and and killed the uh, the giants within the cave. And um, the interesting, there are a few interesting things about this story. Uh, as recently as maybe the early part of the last century, there were some members of you know the Paiute Indigenous American group who had maintained that their ancestors uh, claimed to have remembered the Siteka. And I think that there had been maybe a story also involving one representative of the Siteka that survived and who actually ended up with no place else to go, living with the Paiute until the end of his days. Um, but one of the interesting things is, is that folklorists would recognize that story as being essentially a folkloric motif. And I think um, as far as there being a lot of giant researchers out there who are hot on the trail of trying to find all the suppressed information from the Smithsonian about 10 foot tall giants, um, they, they get a little offended when you say this is folklore. But the interesting thing that should be observed about this is that there are myriad stories about alleged, again, to use a scientific term for what we would colloquially recognize as Sasquatch or Bigfoot uh, and his kith and kindred around the world, there are all kinds of stories in various parts of the world where that same motif emerges. Uh, an example uh, that I've found actually involves on the island of Flores, where now here's the interesting thing. There's some archaeological evidence that may support this, but again, there's a, a tradition. Gregory Forth is an anthropologist who used to, and you probably saw that recent story, Gil, um, 
uh, a write a, a write up that he did an opinion piece for New Scientist where he was essentially arguing there may be another species of hominin alive today other than humans. And he had said that when he arrived on Flores back in the day that uh, they were doing anthropological work and they were doing archaeological excavations. But the people there told him that, well, there are also little hairy people who live on this island today and you never see them very much, but they live off in the woods. And sure enough, just a few years ago, archaeological remains of a new species now recognized as Homo floresiensis. We call them the hobbits because they were diminutive little, you know, human-like uh, mm -hmm. uh, anthropoid, uh, more human-like than ape-like, but then again with more ape-like characteristics, much like some of the archaic hominins from the Pleistocene and earlier. Homo floresiensis. Not, not to be confused with the Denisovans, right? Right, but that's another uh, ancient Pleistocene era hominin that's that's turned up in the archaeological record in, in recent uh, years as well. Uh, and that's the fascinating thing is that, again, if you look at the discovery of Homo floresiensis, the Denisovans, the extant knowledge we have of the Neanderthal, and then other types, uh, there are even other, you know, as yet unrecognized uh, specimens that very likely could point to other kinds of hominins that existed as recently as the last Ice Age. The growing narrative is one that, first of all, completely upends the old single species hypothesis that was once the prevailing dominant you know, theory in anthropology that Homo erectus lived. And then after Homo erectus, this one came along immediately before humans. It was a Neanderthal. And then when they die out, you know, humans come along. That's not the case. During the Pleistocene, Homo sapiens sapiens, modern humans lived alongside Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo floresiensis. I mean, there were abundant different kinds of of hominins and, that existed alongside one another and so now on. yeah and and some have said you know <clears throat> this is more speculative but now we hear these stories of you know these large upright walking apes in the pacific northwest that seemed like such a crazy idea but we also have the fossil remains of gigantopithecus blackie in parts of uh, asia which was a good qualifier for a giant ape uh something akin to sasquatch and more and more people are now saying look you know Add to that the fact that anthropologists like Greg Forth said that when they arrived on Flores, before they found the archaeological remains of these little diminutive creatures on that island, uh, that people were saying, we see them today. They've existed for a long time. Mm. Uh, but coming back to that folklore about the Siteca, one of the traditional legends they tell is that the little people on Flores uh, have actually, uh, at one time, they flourished throughout the island, but that they were at war with the, the other islanders, and so they were driven into a cave, and guess what? A fire was set, and they were burned alive inside the cave. Then you go over to Sri Lanka, and I believe that there's a similar legend there. And then the other interesting thing, too, is that between all these different islands, we have on um, Flores, I think that the uh, indigenous word for them is probably something like gugu. Sumatra or Pendek uh, also would be known by the name of Gugu. Um, if we go to uh, Sri Lanka, I think that the name is Agogwe. Uh, and then in Africa, there is a similar name for a purported diminutive hominid that lives there. Um, and again, similar examples arise when you look at, for instance, one of the names for the Yeti in the Himalayas, Yaren. In Australia, the creature is known as Yowie. Um, in certain American traditions, there is the name Yahoo. One thing I've wondered about is, uh, are some of these names based almost like on automatopoeia? It's, it's, it's a name derived from a noise that the creatures make. Mm. And would that possibly account for the similarities in the names in different parts of the world? Which mm. to me, Yaren, Yowie, Yahoo, I mean, they are at times strikingly similar. Agogwe, Gugu, uh, Agogo. Oh. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. But coming back again to the question about the Siteka, I found it really striking that halfway across the world, the same story of the, you know, hominoids being driven into a cave, the fire being set and killing them all. This folklorists would recognize this as a folkloric motif. And so at times it's difficult to know where the line between the true history of a narrative like that of the Siteka and Lovelock Cave and then the folkloric side you know, where that line between them that distinguishes one side from the other really is often it's more like a blurry mass than it is a definitive line. Yeah. Uh, and something else I wanted to ask you, Micah, um, you're going to be attending uh, several UFO conferences soon. One of them is the UFO Disclosure Symposium in Vernal, Utah, for which you'll be moderating some big panel discussions. And then Huntsville, Alabama, 
for the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies Anomalous Aerospace Conference. Can you um, tell us a little bit more about uh, this uh, symposium, why it's important, and maybe give us the details? Yeah, certainly. Um, the UFO Disclosure Symposium, uh, you know, this is uh, an event. I, again, I'm not giving a lecture there. I'm just going to be moderating a panel. Um, a few of my colleagues that include uh, Professor Avi Loeb, he's going to be uh, chiming in uh, electronically. He actually can't be at the event. <clears throat> but um, indeed, there's uh, an interesting lineup of speakers. And um, as I understand it, also some footage is going to be released, uh, which uh, will probably figure into the panel discussion, uh, one of them that we'll be doing. I think there's actually a couple of those. Uh, but, you know, this event is somewhat in the kind of, I guess, in keeping with a lot. And, you know, Walter and I have had some catch up over this in, in the last couple of days. I think Walter and I both maintain a a degree of cautious skepticism when it comes to UFOs and especially the D word. But for lack of any better expression, there's been a lot of, you know, disclosure that's been happening in the last few years, a lot of disclosures about things that the government has had, uh, things that they've been collecting. Um, my uh, colleague, John Greenwald, in fact, actually uh, used the uh, process known as mandatory declassification review to obtain the classified version of that ODNI report that came out last June. And, you know, I got to tell you, uh, a lot of people were like, ah, oh, there's nothing in that report. I, I would beg to differ. Now, granted, for people like Walter or I or you, Gil, who have followed this subject for a very long time, I wouldn't say there was anything new. There weren't any big revelations in that report. But the significance of it is that, you know, with some of the latest and best technology at the disposal of our military, they are collecting data on this uh, topic. And this is part of what at the UFO Disclosure Symposium, you know, our panels are going to be discussing. We're going to be you know, analyzing some of these developments, some of these, you know, pieces of footage, uh, looking at some of these developments, you know, and understanding, and this is a big important thing for me yet again that Walter and I share, understanding the historical context for all of that, which I think is something that's really missing from the modern UAP dialogue in so many ways, because a lot of people are like, oh, UFOs were all just, you know, myth and the kind of stuff that hucksters spun tails around until 2017 and then all of a sudden it became real and it's like no 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 <laughs> bingo bingo Walter, yeah that's Walter, maybe you can the, talk to that point the 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 big and i think you might agree with this the big misconception that a lot of folks that are new to the topic um are operating under and i keep hearing it being perpetuated on shows and stuff and it's so inaccurate <laughs> is that the government and the military specifically was not particularly interested in UFOs until 2017, and that it's just patently that is absurd. That is a load of bullshit. All of us who studied the history, of it, we know for a fact they've been interested in them since day one. You know, the post World War II era, they've been watching this stuff. Um, I think what where they've mi gotten mixed up is since 2017, there's a fresh spotlight on, "Hey, Uncle Sam, what are you guys doing with this?" And they're having they're 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 attempting a response to it. So a, right. a lot of people, unfortunately, are characterizing it as "gee, they weren't looking at this," and that's um, th that's just not true. Uh, they've they've been looking at it. And you mentioned John Greenwald. Uh, in my opinion, he's done really the best and most real work as far as the D word, you know, disclosure. Um, because yeah, what's he doing? He's going after the documents. He's going after what's actually there and less speculation and he's not afraid to say hey this thing over here that someone is saying or claiming or whatever that's not what the the, the documents are kind of saying the opposite or or such and that's what i like about john's work is he's he, he i think he's an honest broker and you know that always helps in the search for the truth you know you got to be an honest broker no matter what your personal I mean, we'd all we'd all love, you know, just like talking about Colonel Fawcett. Yeah, I would love for, you know, his bones to be found in some lost, you know, city that had, um, you know, artificial lights like he talked about and stuff. But, you know, I'm prepared to accept that that might not have been the case. You know, we, we have to go with what, you know, the truth is and um, or it seems to be based on the evidence. And, and John and the folks who go after, you know um the information and in, in the way that he does uh you know that's what they're trying to do and um it uh it's it's gonna help i come from 
you know, I've said it before. I come from that thing that the answer to, uh, you know, is it is it secret technology? Is it extraterrestrials? Is it ultra terrestrials? The answer yeah. is yes. Yeah. It's all of them, right? Yeah. It's a spectrum. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's faulty thinking. Say... And actually, you know, Ty Rogaway said this over there at the uh, wars in a while back. He said it's faulty thinking, thinking in its finest when you try to say UFOs are this, UFOs are that. Mm. You know, somebody will write into me when Walters come on the show and, and, you know, say, I don't think these airships in the 1890s have anything to do with what we're seeing. And I'm like, and maybe they don't, but that's still a relevant part of all I, this. I don't either, because uh, that's what they saw. <laughs> that's the ironic thing is when I talk about the stuff in the 1890s, I'm talking about the stuff in the 1890s. Yeah. Um, uh, so now I think what the person might be saying is how I show that that is that's just um, uh, 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 one part of the thread leading through history as far as the human technology part of the equation right yes yeah. but I, it, I no Walter, it doesn't explain all ufos today well yeah but well but the other side of it too is that a lot of people are stuck in this if ufos aren't alien then you know i don't want to hear about it and, it, right. and they, don't, they don't want to hear but right. there were actually some very compelling things that were coming together in the 18 you know even earlier than the 1890s but the yeah. airship wave that begins and again, you can interpret that a couple of ways. Was there an experimental technology or mm -hmm. people seeing something that they interpreted as an experimental technology, but these were actually something more exotic? Again, I think it's important to never give yourself to a you know, conclusion when you don't have a full data set. And again, I see the skeptics do this all the time where they're like, mm -hmm oh, this is so easily explainable and people are still putting these videos up on the New York Times, you know, and I'm like, well, you have concluded, uh, but you haven't seen the radar bricks that were confiscated during the Nimitz situation, nor have we asked questions necessarily about why those radar bricks have been, I mean, plenty of people have asked this question. Why were they confiscated? Some would interpret that to mean this was, the, you know, our own technology being tested. Some would, would say, okay, the government's interested in something else that was out there. Um, whatever it is, we don't know. We don't have the full data to be able to conclude. And that's why, you know, Greg Bishop always comes back to that sort of Pyrrhonist mindset of, you know, abstaining from judgment if you don't have all the facts. Really, the Pyrrhonists, the original skeptics, they tried to abstain from making any kind of firm conclusions because they thought that being a human was already a limited point of view <laughs> and that we were well, inherently flawed and therefore you really couldn't make conclusions. Therefore, they didn't. Now, I think it's okay to really. Maybe we can make conclusions, but but nonetheless, I, I, I try, as strange as that sounds, I try not to about UFOs. I entertain all possibilities. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's... I, you, I have you, to say, uh, mm -hmm. Micah, I'm a little concerned that people like Jaime Musan and Paul Hynek are involved, but this is a paying gig, of course, so I know you can't discuss it, so instead let's jump into some uh, group discussion. Uh, the first topic I'd like to begin with involves lost civilizations and breakaway groups what evidence do we have for lost civilizations and who are these breakaway groups anyway why don't you lead off on that one there walter okay um the term and i i have come to prefer a breakaway group over breakaway civilization because i think civilization is too big of a word um, it gives people a very wrong impression about what the reality might be if there are indeed breakaway groups of course richard dolan gave us this the excellent definition which no i never have memorized but uh, he wrote it down so we wouldn't have to remember it but um you know look up the uh but um the, i see where the evidence of a breakaway group can be found in looking at the history of secret societies and these stories of secret societies that we don't know much about like the angelic uh, society that um, allegedly influenced Jules Verne and dates back a while. Um, but basically, you know, the, the, that concept is that there's a group of, uh, a small group of like-minded individuals who have the, the financial and the, uh, the, the personal financial and industrial and technological means which they possess and control to develop on their own uh, technology of their choice and essentially they function among us in our world but with the advantage and the benefit of 
that technology which they've developed now of course some people villainize that those are the people that think everything belongs to everybody and i would argue from a practical perspective well now wait a minute if they're using their money and their resources and their ideas that's what we call proprietary information and, and technology so uh, now it, you could argue the ethics of well gosh if they discover the means of curing a horrible disease they should share that and and i would agree and I think they would agree if, if they've done that, if they've really done that. But the, the idea of the breakaway group involvement in, say, UFOs, or let's look at it this way, UFOs as evidence of a breakaway group's technology, that I think that's going to turn out to be more the case. Um, I've traced this back to, um, you know, the, the, the Prussian-based group that Charles Delshaw writes and talks about, the, the, the NIMSA, um, back to the 1850s. And, uh, you know, I know that I've demonstrated a thread of connection to this group that Delshaw talks about leading up to Germany of the 20th century. And um, it, uh, the idea of this breakaway being involved with the very unification of Germany as we know it, because up until unification of Germany in the 19th century, what we call Germany was 48 different states and uh, they were unified, and then their vision always, you know, was this all this powerful Germany, and and it, you know, it unfortunately resulted in the Third Reich, and then you get into the research and in hypotheses of Joseph Farrell and others who talk about the post World War II Nazi International, the, this this Nazi group that really fits the definition of a breakaway because remember Nazi Germany had lots of money they had been you know both known and rumored to be developing some pretty interesting and exotic technology and uh to flee um uh prosecution what did they do they they took off from Europe as the story goes and went to South America of you know here we are back in South America and so that right there is fits the definition of a breakaway group um, and and this is different from what you call the 1903 group right well the night yeah yeah um i see that del Shao's nimza led to uh was involved in what became nazi germany and whatever nimza was was absorbed into what joseph farrell would call the nazi international gotcha. which unfortunately got its hooks in the United States through our military industrial complex. But that's another whole story through Operation Paperclip. But um, this 1903, that's a name that I have given. Um, I think the airship mystery of the 1890s it was here in the United States. I do not credit that to Del Shell's NIMSA. I just think that was distinctly a group of Americans, industrialists, you know, financiers, whoever, who were experimenting with this technology. And I go into this in a couple of my books. And um, the reason I call it the 1903 is because the stories and lore that surround this mysterious group doing these airships seems to culminate and come to an end in or around 1903 with the story that Tesla was um, hired and asked to design a Tesla uh, airship that could according to the story, go to Mars and all of that. And he does, and they go to Mars and they're never, or they leave the planet and they're never heard from again. And that was in 1903. So for lack of any real evidence that, you know, this group existed, I have referred to it as the 1903 group, which I even question because we can look at traces of, through Delshaw's NIMSA and Farrell's post-war Nazi International, and we can see the threads and traces of the German group, NIMSA, and how it you know, led into the 20th century through Germany and Nazi Germany and blah, 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 so forth. But we really have little to no evidence of that group that I, I call the 1903 that I think might have been responsible for the 1890s airship mystery, except in individuals um it, 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 and there you're getting into um the very interesting story of t townsend brown and the caroline group and groups like that that um 
that uh, are, are still very, very veiled in that murk of history and lore and half truths and, and wild stories. Um, you know, which um, we haven't really even begun to pinpoint the truth on. So I, I think to, really to answer your question, um, the story is still unfolding as mm -hmm. far as the breakaway thing goes, because as we know, the concept, we haven't really put a label on it till, you know, a few years ago with Dolan's definition. And so I think we're in the early stages of... Uh, uh, really identifying, you know, what's been going on between secret societies and, and breakaway groups. Um, you know, it, 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 imagine a group of Elon Musks, okay, doing what Elon Musk is doing, uh, you know, but kind of on the QT on the side. Yeah. And, you know, I'll just add that uh, Dolan, you know, I've talked a lot with Dolan about this concept. Uh, and I think, Walter and I are probably more interested in that potential. Um, and I'll just add a few, uh, a few pretty uh, high profile aerospace and defense journalists uh, who are not known for writing about that, but who privately I've spoken with and many entertain the idea simply for the reason that for a lot of traditional, you know, aerospace and defense journalists, uh, and I think I could give an example of, 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 you know, somebody who certainly looked at that, although I don't know that he necessarily still thinks that that is uh, the root behind all this. But Nick uh, Cook, you know, Hunt for mm -hmm. Zero. Point. I mean, Nick is a great example of, you know, I mean, here here he'd worked with Jane's defense and, and he says, I'm going to get to the bottom of some of this UFO stuff and goes looking at the Nazi component and all of this. Now, he doesn't find any kind of you know, definitive answer to the mystery. But he certainly began working in that era and that area um, because, and if you think about it, to me, it seems very logical. We don't, again, a lot of people lead with the presumption. This kind of goes back really to Donald Kehoe and, and NICAP, even though T. Townsend Brown, as you mentioned there, Walter, you know, I mean, he was, I believe, a co-founding member of NICAP, but basically with the kind of bombastic nature of uh, Kehoe and, and his writing for the you know True Magazine and all these magazines at, at the time, he kind of um, was, um, he kind of, you know, rose to prominence as the ufologist at that time and became the, mm -hmm. you know, basically the, the uh, head of NICAP. But the point is, is that NICAP, they were pretty convinced, even from early on, that, you know, UFOs must be extraterrestrial. If we step back and we ask ourselves, how sure are we about that? If we recognize it for what it really is, it is a presumption. And even if there's some good data that supports that conclusion, um, we still don't have enough data to say that with certainty that's what it is. Right. And so a lot of aerospace and defense writers, I can totally see why they are drawn to the notion that, well, then can we account for these mysterious aerial technologies in terms of some aspect of historical developments and in, in, in the industrial military you know, side of things or the military industrial complex, as Dwight called it, you know, that, that remains unaccounted for for most history. There are instances where when we stepping over to the secret society side of things, you know, if you look at Carol Quigley's classic book, Tragedy and Hope, he's talking all about the fact that there were, you know, hidden groups that had, he said, essentially steered much of, uh, you know, the developments of the last century or so in, in the Western world. And he says, and it's a shame that they don't want their work and their names publicized because he says, I feel like a lot of what they've done is really important. It's really good. Mm -hmm. But they prefer not to, you know, publicize this. And again, we could go down the list of, you know, roundtable groups, you know, and the Chatham House and all this sort of stuff. Um, I think Robin, uh, oh gosh, what's Robin's name? I probably have the book over there on the shelf someplace, but it tells the story of, uh, of uh, you know, the birth of many of these, you know, secret societies uh, uh, and their and their origins in England and the notion of, you know, how can we use this secret society to establish a new world order? Anyway, there's been lots written about this, but the point I'm trying to make is that um, a lot of people see that and they ask, okay, you know, there have been political groups for reasons of politics, for reasons of, you know, whatever else, um, you know, territorialism, you know, land grabs and everything else you can imagine throughout history that have worked secretly because it worked to their benefit to do so. Now, can we extend that idea to some sort of aerospace technology developments that maybe occurred sometime in the last century or so, maybe with some change, 
to account for the aerial mysteries that occur. Because frankly, a lot of people just don't want to say, well, they must be extraterrestrials. That's just going a little too far out there. Yeah. They may share the thoughts of someone like, you know, Seth Shostak and say, you know, we, we've been looking out there. We've been, we've been looking and we've not found anything. What's the likelihood that extraterrestrials are going to just turn up right here on earth? And at times, and I know Walter probably feels the same. I mean, I have to step outside my own frame of reference from time to time and go, maybe they got a point. And so that's yeah. what I find interesting about the breakaway civilization idea. But when I've talked with Dolan about it, you know, Dolan's like, you know, he'll, he'll quickly tell you, I introduced that kind of as like a thought experiment. It's an idea, but I don't necessarily endorse it. I think if anything, I, I Dolan don't know if you've be, seen this or not, Micah, but. Uh, Richard Dolan's book on breakaway civilizations is about that thick. Yeah. I mean, he has, <laughs> I think with respect, you know, that, I that, I, that idea has become so interesting to people that Dolan, of course, was compelled to write something about it. But again, he's not really, and I like this about him. He's, he's someone who can say, here's an idea, but I don't necessarily have to endorse that idea. The late Mac Tonys was, was the same way with that very short book on the cryptoterrestrials. Mm -hmm. He said, let's engage in a kind of valet esque thought experiment about what UFOs, what else they might be. Sadly, he had no idea when he was writing that, that he would die uh, tragically at a very young age. And, and now everyone's yeah. like, and Tony's thought that these things were from earth. Well, no, he didn't think that he introduced that idea and he states yeah. in the book, it's a thought experiment. So anyway, all that to say, the breakaway yeah, civilization. I, I think crypto terrestrials would have been a much bigger book if he hadn't passed away. Yeah. yeah, and I'm I'm glad. I remember when we learned that Tony's died. I mean, literally that day, the the news broke. I was talking with his publisher Patrick Weege, and he had told me that you know we're going to get Greg and Nick to come in and do a forward and an Talk afterward to kind of make it a little lengthier. And thank goodness they managed. They, they salvaged what they had of that manuscript, and we do have that. But again, just like the breakaway civilization idea, just like looking at the 1800s airship mystery, whether or not related to the 1890s thing, the 1903 that Walter talks about, Nimza, Delshaw, all this, these things all may be interrelated. They may be completely separate. They may be true. They may be half-truths. We don't know. But these things help us to orient ourselves around a mystery that endures that we do not have all the answers for right. and that we do not have enough data to make conclusions about. So we should be open to other alternatives. And so... Yeah. In that context, yeah, I've certainly looked at the um, the breakaway civilization idea. And one final thing I'll add to, because Walter's a significant part of this and how I got into all this. Um, at some point, I think it was our friend uh, Red Pill Junkie, of course, who first told me about the very mysterious story of the friendship and Friendship Island. Not the friendship from the 1950s in the Italian UFO case, but this is a situation that originated back in the 1980s uh, down off the coast of uh, Chile near an area called Chiloé Island. And um, it really kind of begins with this guy named Ernesto de la Fuente, who um, he had been miraculously healed after he had basically met, uh, met with some guys who called themselves the Holy Brothers. They all went by names like, you know, Raphael and Michelangelo, you know, and Leonardo, kind of like Ninja Turtles, you know, or Renaissance creators, you know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and then there also was this Octavio Ortiz, uh, who, who was a, 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 a shipmaster who had been in radio communication with these individuals who were asking him and they would pay him and others to bring materials out to this Island. And it began to become the strange story of these people who around, uh, uh, um, the location there near Chile, uh, uh Chiloé Island, uh, Puerto Montt, I think is the town right there. A lot of people started saying that, you know, the, the, the Holy brothers, they arrive in a ship called the Mitalus too. Um, sometimes they pay with blocks of like rare metal. They'll buy sick cattle and all kinds of strange stuff, you know. Um, some people have told these stories. There's also this tradition about this ghost ship that's seen out there called El Caliuche. But the interesting thing is, is that uh, a lot of people in modern times have said, well, we see El Caliuche. It's this glowing ship that flies above the surface of the water. And that's what the Holy Brothers, you know, sail around in. I really became compelled by this story because it sounded like a good qualifier for a kind of breakaway civilization thing. I mean, some Latin American researchers who have looked into this have likened it to like a, a, a Chilean Area 51 that's based on an island somewhere. But some of the locals say very strange things like, and, you know, Walter will find this interesting, although we've talked about this years ago. Uh, he, they'll say there are gringos on that island, uh, and some of them speak German and some of them speak English. And it's like, okay. 
So about the time I heard this, uh, I think it was uh, probably my good buddy Adam Sane who said, dude, you got to get Bosley on your show. And I said, yeah, I think I will. <laughs> so Bosley, you came on my show for the first time, Walter, and we talked about this. And I was getting your perspective on the like, whole you know, breakaway civilization thing because I was really going down that rabbit hole on, you know, is there something going on in South America that mm -hmm. could be related to all of this? And lo and behold, I had to fly to England right after this. So, like, you were the last interview that I did before I had to go to England, Walter, and I fly to uh, to uh, London, but I was I had a layover in the Netherlands. It was like 5 in the morning, hadn't slept, and I was getting a coffee, and, um, and I'm checking my emails in the airport there, and I have an email from a guy named... Um, uh, uh, Peter Lavenda and and Peter Lavenda is just emailing me saying hey I heard your show the other day with Walter Bosley and you, the story you guys were talking about about that island reminds me of something really weird that happened to me down there in South America which if anyone has ever read the book on the Holy Alliance the first mm -hmm. and the last chapter are all about this what he did was he and there's a, a fantastic film uh, about this called Colonia starring uh, um, Emma Watson yeah. but uh, Peter went down there to this infamous Colonia Dignidad. And he hired a driver to take him up there into the mountains, and he went to this place. And, of course, the story is that there was an escaped Nazi. Uh, Paul Schaefer, I think, was his name, not to be confused with the pianist, you know, of late-night television fame. But uh, this guy had a, um operation up there where it was this weird kind of religious cult thing, but they also had military equipment, and they were also doing, you know, secret work in support, I think, of the Pinochet regime, very strange situation. And, uh, and Lavenda goes down there to investigate this mm -hmm. 20 something kid, you know, with the beard shows up, starts, gets out of a cab, starts taking pictures and they shut the gates and people start coming out and his <laughs> passport is confiscated. And he thinks, Oh gosh. And they probably thought he was like a Mossad agent or something, but they come back out there and everything, give him his passport and said, you leave tomorrow. And his flight was already booked. And, and literally he said that on his way out of the country, that several times the bus was stopped and officials would get on the bus, talk to the driver, point back there, look at him, go, get off the bus. And he even said that all the way back to Miami, uh, when he got back to Miami, I just flew into Miami International the other day, and it's kind of legendary for this sort of stuff. But he was actually stopped and basically debriefed and kind of questioned when he got back to Miami. And uh, the story just never left me. I mean, so is the situation with, with some of these stories in South America – everything that it's made out to be. I don't know, but it's hard to deny that there's something going down there. And if you look at the history that's been established by guys like Lavenda, there's something very, very interesting and concerning maybe in some ways too. Well, you know, um, when I was doing research on my book, Shimmering Light, which I uh -huh. go into Operation Paperclip on that, um, I can't remember if it was, I don't think it was Hubertus Strughold, but it was one of the um, Operation Paperclip uh, uh, aerospace aviation medicine guys who in the 50s when, um, it, it's interesting, uh, uh, several um, American Jewish American um, journalists were the ones who uncovered some of the former Nazis who uh, we brought into Operation Paperclip. And it was really embarrassing the Air Force, you know, the new young Air Force at the time and the DOD and the U.S. government. So they were really forced to cut loose some of these guys. And there's one of them. Again, I don't think it was Strughold. It, 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 I could be wrong on that. But um, one of them. They escorted, they either put him on a plane to, or they escorted him on the plane to Brazil. I'm pretty sure it was Brazil. I don't think it was Argentina in this case. And they just let him go in. It was like, okay, get off the plane. That's it. You no longer work for the United States government. And, you know, so, so I've, I've always thought that was interesting how they knew to just, you know, why not take him back to Germany? Um, where the authorities could follow through on any prosecutions or whatever, you know, because, of course, you know, it was post-Nuremberg and all that, the trials. But they took him, the U.S. government escorted him, took him to South America and just said, go. Oh, yeah. Uh, th that's really interesting. And, and that's, that's, a, that's part of, that's not speculation. That is a documented is part of, 
of oh, well, paperclip history. That is, and uh, so is, of course, the uh, the fact, again, that Klaus Barbie uh, mm -hmm. you know, operated as a CIA informant in South America for many years. He was eventually apprehended, and he was taken back, I believe, to, to France. Of course, you know, his dreaded nickname from the Second World War was the Butcher of Lyon, so that mm -hmm. makes all the sense in the world, and he did stand trial. Um, there was that interesting guy that, and again, I, I love, you know, I'd been reading uh, one of Joseph P. Farrell's books a few years ago. And again, I've always found Farrell's research very interesting because um, although he talks a lot about UFOs, I asked him once, I said, you know, were you first interested in UFOs? And, and Farrell kind of chuckled and said, I'm a guy who is kind of a historical researcher, but I'm interested in physics too. And because of those two interests, I, it keeps bringing me back to UFO related stuff, but that's a secondary interest. But I mean, it's yeah. fascinating where it ends up taking him. And anyway, uh, it, there's that book you wrote a few years ago called Saucers, Swastikas, and Psyops. Yeah. And uh, he, he mentions you in the book, of course, Walter. But um, he talks about this very curious guy, Ronald Richter. Do you remember that story? I've The name, of course, I remember, but specifically, I'm not placing the reference he was a uh, like a i think he may have been austrian born but he had during the second world war worked with germany and was probably one of those scientists who was not a pro-nazi you know pro third reich scientist right. and who really was there because unfortunately you know as was the case you know you think about the uh the the um there were a lot of scientists who you know wanted out of germany because they didn't want you know what their technological capabilities and their their you know scientific prowess and know-how might be used for. They didn't want to see that come to fruition under the Reich right. and in the furtherance of the objectives of the Reich, you know, during wartime, which could have been horrific, even more so than things already were. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Richter had apparently come back and I think had, uh, had been hired by, I believe it was like Juan Perón. And the U.S. Air Force investigated this guy because he claimed that he had uncovered some kind of physics that would just reshape all of aviation mm -hmm. and that he could he said that aircraft that i will design based on these principles won't need wings and they won't need a, a runway they'll just be able to kind of take off what's that sound like you know and it, it's it's really strange you remember that document i shared with you too when you were on my show the other day walter uh that i believe was an old fbi document from a former polish uh uh national who was a prisoner under mm -hmm. the Reich in the Second World War, and he provided this very elaborate testimony of this humming noise that he'd heard yeah. at this camp that he was in. And he said that when this humming noise would happen, there was some sort of experimentation going on behind this kind of a circular wall. But when this humming mm -hmm. noise would happen, he says that this tractor that was out there that was being used for the labor effort would shut down. Mm -hmm. It would just cut off. And to my knowledge, by the way, here's an interesting side note. I don't know that the idea of electromagnetic pulse was known necessarily at that point. I mean, we may have had an idea of an electromagnetic energy source being used to interfere with electrical systems. But, you know, I think it goes back to Operation Starfish Prime as part of the uh, U.S. Air Force tests back in the 1950s where we launched, you know, a Titan rocket into space mm -hmm. and with a nuke on it, detonate that in low, you know, in space and low Earth orbit and everything. And then the resulting shock wave knocked out the power in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we learned, oh, wow, a, a nuclear this weapon. This is the infamous shock Project wave. Starfish, right? Yeah, Project uh, Starfish Prime, I believe, was the name. Yeah. But recall, again, Joseph Farrell presents the data and the reports of what oh, appeared yeah. to have been an EMP during World War II yeah. because something blew up in Thuringia, I don't pronounce it right, Thuringia or Thuringia Woods, and that the telephone and electrical system of Berlin was shut down. And yeah. it looks like that a nuclear detonation connected with EMP uh, might have had its um, uh, proof of concept with German well, tests that during the made, war and think about it this u.s air force thing golly where were we getting our science and technology right after the war mm. well, you know walter that that would have made berlin completely unlivable by radioactivity wouldn't it no 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 well, no not not emp not in emp the the a a smaller nuclear um uh, burst cause the emp itself is not there's not radiation necessarily Right. It, it, it's just but it, it's a shock the of a, a nuclear detonation it is but uh, again what Farrell outlines and again it's 
it, I remember when he gave this lecture about what you're talking about, Walter, and I was like, God, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. Because there is a historical document that Farrell has produced that I believe it was an Italian aircraft officer, Italian Air Force officer, who had observed what in the parlance of post-World War II we would call a mushroom cloud. Mm -hmm. He observed mm -hmm. this cloud rising out over i can't remember what the lake was but there the, the claim had been that there had been this test i think on an island or in this forest or something along those lines like you're describing and he said that as he's flying he observed the detonation that there was clearly something and that what Farrell finds is that the date of that sworn testimony i believe it was you know it was a sworn document that this man said you know here's what i saw on, and on this mm -hmm. date and that coincided with a you know temporary power outage that right. knocked out the entire power grid for about a day or two in, in Berlin, yeah. which is fascinating. Um, but but again, I've talked to a lot of historians who are like, oh, impossible. No way. There's no way in hell that is just put that out of your mind because it didn't happen. But they, it, 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 it's interesting, though, sometimes I find that the vehemence sometimes of the naysayers is interesting in itself. Oh, sure. Well. You know, again, it's like we we know history so well that we can just completely immediately rule out all these possibilities. That's right. But then you look at the fact that there are some of these underground facilities that even to this day, uh, these are locations that were known to have been used during the Second World War by the Nazis. And they've gone in there with, you know, Geiger counters and they still detect significant amounts of radiation. So there were tests and there were facilities with radiation, radioactive material uh, and it's no question, I don't think, I think we can agree that the Nazis did not, you know, they didn't harness the power of the atom and do what the United States did, but they certainly were hoping to work toward that goal. That's the scary thing. They were much, my view is they were much closer than the comfort of the way history likes to be told about World sure, War II. They, and, were, and they were, they were much closer. And what Farrell argues is that, you know, well, maybe there is some data that supports, you know, the power generation that would have been needed. There are eyewitness testimonies. And again, as a historian, you know, I'm not a historian, by the way, but I'm a, I'm a opponent. I love history, you know, but uh, as an amateur historian, we might say I'm fascinated when I hear about a primary source document that seems to convey information in the furtherance of an yeah. idea like that. So the Italian Air Force officer, that testimony has always been really interesting to me. So, you know, who knows? But again, all this coming back to the idea that, uh, you know, an EMP and the effect of an EMP on a vehicle or other electrical systems. The document I was telling Walter about, this Polish uh, gentleman who had been at this camp described that there'd be this loud humming and that all of a sudden this tractor would shut down. Now, we would recognize that as being potentially the effect of an electromagnetic pulse that temporarily disabled this vehicle. And he says at one point above this wall that where this enclosure was that this object that essentially looked like a saucer rises up and hovers above this thing and moves around a little bit and then goes back down. He perceived that this object was making the noise and that when the humming noise that accompanied the sighting of this thing came on, this tractor would shut off. This was an FBI document. Uh, yeah. Now, mm -hmm. it, whether that is a true document, I mean, because Farrell, Farrell would tell you, well, you know, we also have reports of saucers with iron crosses that were seen hovering over the River Thames the that were reported in the New York Times. What was it, Gil? Hanabu shit. Well, uh, well, you know, here's the thing. <laughs> If you ask Farrell about that, Farrell's actual interpretation of why there were, I mean, and he's citing a New York Times article that described that, but he says that didn't happen until after both the war and after UFOs, of course, were already in the newspapers. And so he says, in my opinion, what that, yeah, and what that clearly was, that was intentional misinformation. We were trying to, we knew that the Soviets were reading our major newspapers and we were trying to tell them, oh, this was captured German technology. They're flying all over, over the skies, you know, in the U.S. So whose are they? Who do they belong right. to? Which is, honestly, I think Farrell's probably spot on on his interpretation. Well, you know, to, to go back to the, uh, the, the nuke-powered uh, EMP, within the context of you know, how did we discover EMPs with nuclear? Okay, that's just within the thread of how an EMP is caused through nuclear detonation. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the only way, like you demonstrated with this right. object, that EMPs could be caused. So here's the interesting thing. It's almost a diversion to when the historians say, oh, get that idea out of your mind that any kind of nuclear test would have caused this. Okay, but that doesn't mean it wasn't some other type of exotic technology, which 
they were indeed fooling around with. Um, so it, it still it might not be tied to we might have discovered EMP through nuclear detonation. Of course, we did. We know that's a fact. But that, that doesn't, doesn't mean, mean that the there aren't thing. other ways that, you know, they were playing around with doing it and, and discovered. Um, now, gentlemen, uh, because we're in our second hour of the show already, I, I realize it, it, it only seems like you just got here. Uh, but I'm going to kind of go into rapid fire mode here. So okay. uh, if we can make our answers a little bit more brief, we can still have interplay between the two of you. Which is you got to be careful with Walter and I. We'll go all night. Yeah, yeah we, we're, there, there's so much stuff in our heads that we're... But th these, can, <laughs> these can be as easy you as understand yes or the no blah, blah, blah. answers, you know, or, or you know... Uh, I don't think so, or, you know, whatever. Sure. Uh, there's been a resurgence of people talking about underground alien bases and the Dulce base uh, where humans and aliens are working together. Some some pretty nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, where do each of you stand on this alleged underground base, and do you think there's any merit to it? Walter, you go. Me first? Okay, well, as you know, I've kind of written a book exploring my own father's claim and story of that and i have to say that you know i went about that objectively and um i think while i'm not going to say i know for sure that it's not true um this is a story that has been around and gets recycled um when you when you throw into the mix quite frankly let's be honest with ourselves we have to be ufology is full of people who don't tell the truth unfortunately there i mean there there's been peppered in amongst the sincere folks so i don't think i i doubt that that's true i i think that's something that um that that those popular stories i seriously doubt them and um that's a whole discussion that you can point to the evidence that a lot of it's been made up um i of course propose that um uh, there's a whole connection of that that the u.s air force in the 1950s had with mk ultra this is documented history okay and they loved it they were turned on by it and they started their own program and i have proposed that this would explain my dad's belief in his underground other people story, uh, which was complete with the being startled and, you know, weapons being fired and someone being killed. It's, it's always a variation of that same exact story. And I think that's something, it's a false narrative that gets recycled for a variety of reasons that it's a longer discussion, but that's where I'm at. I, well, it's, it's not true had, on the face of we it. We had abductee Terry Lovelace on the show. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm curious what uh, your thoughts are, Micah, about uh, what abductees and remote viewers say they've seen uh, aliens and humans working together in bases on the moon. Hmm. Uh, recently, Terry Lovelace said that he discovered many of the humans working on the bases worked there for life. And I was curious uh, what you held to regarding that. How much of it you think is, uh, you know, speculation, and how much is bullshit, etc. Well, I'll just say first of all about the Dulcie base. Um, really, everybody should read Adam Goratley's book, Saucers, Spooks, and Kooks. Great book that uh, yeah. establishes the history of that idea uh, and really its origins. Um, and I think that it really—I don't want to give too much away, but I'll give you a hint because this is. Uh, part of the focus of that book, it kind of all hinges on this mysterious character called Tal Levesque. And uh, I have now, having read that book, I now have all kinds of renewed suspicions about Mr. Levesque, who passed away, I think, maybe in 2018 or 2019, fairly recently. But I now have suspicions about uh, his involvement in all sorts of other kinds of memes and, and folklore that have been introduced into ufology. So back to Walter's point, unfortunately, and Levesque admitted some of this to, to go rightly in communications, he, he completely made up a bunch of this stuff, but he claimed that he did it to make people think. So again, everybody's got to read the book to get the full story on how he essentially created the Dulce base mythos. And I would identify it as that. Although I'll also point out a, a couple of quick things. Uh, one, 
Greg, uh, Greg Valdez, who is the son of Gabe Valdez, the you know famous police officer who you know not, not only investigated sure. cattle mutilations but also later joined the National Institute for Discovery Sciences under Robert Bigelow. He and his son claimed they went up there to Mount Archaluda and that they also found evidence of what they thought was some sort of an underground facility. Um, and and then the NIDS investigations under Colm Kelleher at Al back in the 1990s, they also said that there was an abundance of, uh, you know, paranormal, for lack of a better term, uh, activity that seemed to center on Dulce. So one interpretation might be that uh, there were actual things happening uh, that were, again, you know, one interpretation would be related to an underground base. Another interpretation mm -hmm. might be that this was part of a sort of disinformation campaign to detract, you know, from actual Air Force operations that might have been going on there. And I think that's what Adam Gorotli would at least entertain and what maybe Greg Valdez, the son of Gabe, seemed to uh, suggest. Now, all that said, um, I've met Terry Lovelace. Uh, he's a wonderful guy. We spent some time together actually up in Kentucky he's last year. He's a lovely, lovely gentleman, yeah. He's a wonderful guy, yeah. Um, as far as people working on the moon and things like that, <clears throat> I don't know what Terry's views are, are on that. Uh, you know, so with respect to Terry, I can't speak to that point. Um, one thing that comes to mind, though, is that book by Ingo Swan, Penetration. right? Penetration. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, uh, you know, the guys from um, from uh, um, Astonishing Legends uh, uh, asked me to read that book uh, to help put together an episode that they did on that idea. And, uh, you know, I love Scott and Forrest. And so, you know, that was a fun project. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have necessarily read that book. But there's some very interesting claims that Swan makes in it. And one of them is that as he's remote viewing the moon, he sees all these like mining operations and things going on. And that there are these people who are butt naked up there who are digging on the moon. And it's it's a rather interesting um, story. I'm, I'm needless to say a bit dubious. I, I, I find the story questionable at very best. But I'll also say this. That I think that that might have been the beginning of a lot of those ongoing kind of tropes that were borrowed. And it's just like what Walter's talking about with regard to his dad. Why is it that certain nearly archetypal themes, yeah. underground bases, mining operations on the moon, right? Crash retrievals of flying saucers. That motif appears again and again and again and again with minor variations. Yeah. Before Roswell was a thing, Leonard Stringfield had like 10 flying saucer crashes he was looking into in the 1970s. And so the thing is, it's like, guys, we have to recognize at some point that much like the cave, right, and the, the, the giants or the diminutive hominoids being chased into it and then a fire is being set and this story appears all over the world, when you have a common motif that recurs again and again and again, a folklorist is going to look at that and say, I know what that is, and it probably ain't true, although it may have a basis in some truth. Exactly. Right. Exactly. A okay. nugget. A nugget of truth in there that nugget gets extrapolated truth. out and exaggerated and taken out of context. Uh, yes. Because we know there's been underground bases. I mean, they were really getting into this actual underground base stuff seriously after world war ii even during um, world war ii for uh, even during world war ii but really after the war especially and and for for very logical you know no pun intended down to earth reasons so yeah of course there's been underground installations but you throw that layer of the fantastical on it and it helps deflect most public interest they're yes. gonna go. Oh, that's that's all. That's all crazy stories. There's gonna be there's gonna be those people like us that are gonna be really intrigued and look deeper, you know. But um, but yeah, it, it's nugget of truth. Nugget of truth. Yeah. Let's uh, switch gears for a moment and spend a little time talking about ARVs or alien reproduction vehicles. These are alleged reverse engineered craft flown by the Air Force uh, pilots, or maybe even higher up, uh, that people go to the exact right spot can see, or used to see on Wednesdays at Area 51. Do you think these are real, and do you think that they're actually alien reproduction vehicles? Micah, go. Okay, sure. Um, really quickly, you know, a lot of this story kind of comes from Bob Lazar. A lot of people still question his uh, claims. Then again, there are aspects of his story that have remained remarkably consistent over the years. And one thing that we shouldn't overlook is no matter what you think about uh, Bob Lazar, he was taking John Lear out there 
and they were watching and they were filming and he did know when those tests were going on. And that's always kind of been one sticking point sure. for me. How did, how did he know when the tests were taking place? And I don't consider myself a champion of the Bob Lazar narrative per se, although it's important to recognize, you know, the pros and the cons on these things. Now that said, uh, he also tells these stories about, you know, having at one point, you know, been directed his attention, you know, over to like a window and he sees the back of the head of something that might've been an alien. And he later goes on to say what? Well, they, they might've actually hypnotized me at some point and they may have introduced these narratives. And again, what does that sound like, Walter? That sounds again, like MK ultra that remember, he also used to talk about, um, uh, being given this pine smelling liquid that he would have to drink. And he quit talking about that because when you have what could be a narrative layer and you combine that with some type of substance you're ingesting, that's right out of the MK Ultra playbook. And and little, remember, when little. we talk about that, we're talking about documented, documented. How history. about a little sodium pentothal? Scared uh, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I I think, in my opinion, I think to the extent to to the limited extent that Lazar's saying anything that's true. I think it's a case of him being monkeyed with. Um, but, uh, you know, the wild stories about, you know, the well, we're talking about reproduction vehicles. Uh, you know, if you've got a line of technology you're developing and you really want to bury the development of that and who's working on it as far as personnel and locations and stuff, to me, it sounds like, another disinformation story. Oh, we captured this from something that crashed from another world right. and we we reproduced it. No, you didn't. You developed it. Very human technology. And, you know, so I think the vehicles, I, I don't have a problem with the vehicles existing. I do not think that they were alien reproduction vehicles. I, right. I think that's part of the, um, the disinformation because people have brought up, they can navigate across the stars, but they can't not crash these flying saucers all... <laughs> Yeah, no, right. And another well, thing, too, I mean, Walter, that must be pointed out is that, you know, you hear the people telling stories of, um, I mean, people who worked in aerospace, you know, who were part of skunk works and things would say, you know, I was tasked to build this part of this thing. And yeah. the way that they would do it is we nobody was building the entire thing. Everybody had a component they built. Right. So nobody knew what the end result, you know, would look like. What does yeah. Lazar say? Lazar says essentially the same thing. Yeah. You know, we're out there and we're working on some sort of thing. And one, I would do this. Slice. Yeah, exactly. And that sounds an awful lot to me like, you know, the, the general method that has been used to maintain secrecy, even with those who are in the in the process of constructing these very earthly vehicles. Exactly. Exactly. And so, I, you know, I know it's fun to think that extraterrestrials crashed and ooh, we figured out something to reverse the reverse engineering of it. But I, I personally Maybe all we figured out was how to go up and down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. uh, Micah, recently you had uh, Adam go rightly on your show. Mm -hmm. According to him, what happened between John Lear and Paul Benowitz uh, that crashed uh, caused Benowitz to leave ufology? And do you think Lear was responsible for the events that led to Benowitz's death? Oh no, I don't. I don't think that Lear was responsible. But um, I think again, there's a lot that's going on right there. And I got to be careful because I'm in the presence of a former AFOSI guy here. Oh, so yeah. he's, he's, he's taking notes. No, I'm kidding. I mean, but you know, if, I always if, uh, laugh about Walter that because like you, he will find a way to kill you. There, 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 are some, there are some who, you know, have, have said this about Walter. And I'm thinking, you know, just because you have worked with the Air Force doesn't necessarily right. mean that you can't have an interest in all this stuff. Too, right. you know? sure. But then, but and the big difference too, especially is that, uh, you know, with respect to Mr. Richard Doty, uh, mm. a, a gentleman who many people don't have much respect for. Uh, I definitely don't have a lot of confidence in him. Well, that's the point. Exactly. Exactly, Gil. Here's the thing. You can't ever, I mean, the stories are constantly changing or they're being denied or there's right. this or that. And at the end of the day, nobody knows what to think because, again, you can never nail that guy down. And so, again, Alejandro Rojas and I were talking earlier this week, and Alejandro actually said, you know, at one point, I FOIA'd the Air Force to try and get information about whether the AFOSI actually did uh, drive Benowitz crazy. And back to your point, that seems to be where the, the, the you know, the craziness came. I don't think it was John Lear. It seemed to be that, uh, that Doty was, of course, presenting this misinformation to Benowitz. 
But according to Alejandro, he says, you know, we need to be very careful because there isn't a lot of evidence in terms of documentation that that was an Air Force operation. And even Go Rightly has argued, even Go Rightly has said, listen, uh, th one alternative theory is that, you know, there's the rogue agent Doty theory that this guy was just doing this stuff on his own accord. And, and, and some of the evidence for that is that he was immediately after that whole situation, he was sent to Germany and then he comes back, I think, to like Kirtland, but he was running the mess hall. And it, that seems to be very much like disciplinary action. So yeah, that's, that's one interpretation. But last point really quickly about your question, and this is something that's really interesting that Go Rightly raises a very interesting point about. Uh, there was this uh, ufological symposium, Christian Lambright, great researcher who's written some about this because he was there. Um, Lear was trying to kind of get everybody on board with this kind of statement on ufology that was sort of, you know, based around his sort of dark side hypothesis, this whole thing going back to Eisenhower, aliens are allowed to abduct so many people, cattle mutilations are a part of all this, and we're all doomed. And when the people at the group meeting wouldn't kind of get on board with that, uh, Lear was kind of pouty, and he and Linda Howe left, uh, according to the, the story, they left that weekend and um, went to meet other researchers. But after that, Lear goes to see Benowitz, stays a couple of days, and after they after they parted ways, Benowitz got out of ufology. He didn't want anything to do with Lear and never wanted to see him again. And nobody really knows exactly what happened to them. And I found that really interesting because yeah. it might have just been that they just didn't got on each other's nerves or didn't agree. Maybe Benowitz was already trying to get out of ufology. He'd been hospitalized at that point, and his family kind of said, okay, you're off the juice, no more UFOs. Yeah. And it may have been that he just was, you know, who knows? We'll, we'll probably never know. But I don't fault... John, the late John Lear, I don't think he was responsible for what happened to Benowitz. Go ahead, Walter. I, I just want to enhance that because I've tried to point this out to, you know, in the past. Um, when I really, when I read Greg's book for the first time years ago and talked about it with Greg, um, mm -hmm. when I, I had that been an OSI, be Project I had been, Beta. Yeah, Project Beta. Yeah, um, Project Beta. I had been an OSI agent for a year when I started working on a project, went to my boss and, and basically Doty, first time I ever heard of Richard Doty, and he was presented to me as a cautionary tale, meaning, oh. yeah, he had gotten in trouble a little bit and, you know, don't be, don't be like Rich, you know, but uh, it, it, so it, here's the thing. Years later, I meet Greg, I read his book, I look closer at this thing. I have said this ever since I took my first close look at that. Nobody ever remembers or, or, or looks at the culpability of the NSA in this. Um, I, I see where the NSA, in my opinion, had the deepest hand in driving Benowitz over the edge with some of the things that they were likely doing technologically. Um, uh, now, believe me, the misinformation that that Doty and Bill Moore were giving, they admit Dis that disinformation. Contributed. Disinformation. Disinformation. Yeah, the disinformation. They admit that that you know contributed, but but it's like everybody forgets that the NSA was in the mix. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, and I'm not defending Doty or defending OSI, I just know that organization. Mm -hmm. And I understand if Doty got in trouble, I understand how and why, because I know that organization. And yeah, if he went off the, the, the prescribed rails, he would have gotten in trouble. And that's my understanding of what happened. But I, I blame the NSA. I really do. And I, I think I'm going to make a T-shirt that says, I blame the NSA. And on the back, it'll say, I really do. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> really quickly, let me, let me very, very, very briefly add just to what Walter okay. is saying. You know, again, the points that must be recognized. NSA had been conducting the tests at Kirtland. They were what Benowitz was picking up on. And so it was to cover that, not anything the Air Force was necessarily doing. Right that led to the disinformation effort thereafter. Again, if you read Go Rightly's book, he'll point out that, you know, NSA agents had actually been monitoring UFO researchers thereafter. I think one of them was Todd Zetchel, right, from the old Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, right, Cause. And, um, and at that time, what was going on? Cause had filed a lawsuit against the NSA to try and get UFO uh, documents. They actually ended up filing a lawsuit against the CIA and getting documents. They attempted a similar uh, process with the NSA because the NSA initially said we have no UFO documents. But then when they did a similar FOIA with the FBI, the FBI says we've got a few documents, but we've got to clear it through the NSA before we can release those to you. And so the, so the FBI inadvertently 
reveals the NSA had documents. So they send that and they say to the NSA, guys, the FBI just told us you have to clear these documents. We want and your they, documents. That's when they lost them. Well, then they, they sent a few to the cause organization, but then they said there are like, you know, several others that we can't send you. So that's when the lawsuit ensues. A district judge ruled in favor of the NSA after seeing an affidavit uh, stating, and he agreed with this based on the information he was given. He said, the public interest in the UFO topic does not outweigh in this People, instance yeah. national security interests that would be potentially compromised if the NSA re reveals this information to the public. And so the NSA didn't release the documents. Since then, coming back to Greenwald, Greenwald has filed FOIA requests to try and get those documents in more recent years. And now the NSA just says they don't exist. We lost them. They were destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. So the NSA's history, you know, again, stretches into several areas. Obvious uh, deception and, and lying, maybe in the interest of national security, but lying nonetheless, spying on certain UFO researchers, and further, of course, also uh, covering their operations and perhaps that extending to other agencies in the furtherance of trying to cover that. And Benowitz was the unfortunate casualty of that operation. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and my personal experience with NSA was being trained at one of their schools, the NSA Cryptologic School, for 11 months. I was with the FBI and it was language training, but um, there was something else going on that we were not informed about, but we were the subjects, the objects of what, what else was going on. It was a convenience thing. It's like, hey, we need bodies to train these people in this thing. And uh, FBI said, oh, well, okay, we'll send nine bodies to you for your language school. And, um, you know, because the FBI usually sends people to DLA in Monterey, but they sent two classes, my class and then the one after ours, and then they quit doing it. So my personal experience with NSA is very, very secretive. I mean, that's what I learned from the few NSA personnel that I talked with over the course of those 11 months. Uh, you know, just very, if people think the CIA is secretive. You know, I learned more about the CIA and my association with them than I did, you know, from NSA. So um, anyway, for what that's worth, yeah, I I pin Benowitz on the CIA. Hmm. Okay, or the so, NSA. Um, I'm sorry, the NSA. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. we're we're gonna enter rapid rapid fire mode, but before okay. we do, I wanted to ask Micah, uh, what do we have for uh, a giveaway that you can autograph for our weekly winner of the of the spinner wheel? Well, I'm looking across the room here uh, at a, a beautiful copy. Actually, if I can step away from the camera for just Please a moment. Do. Yeah. And no one mentioned to Micah that we're making fun of him while he's off screen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have uh, this beautiful copy here of my book, The Ghost Rockets. Oh, cool. Let me, let me make you big. Yeah, which uh, this, oh, that's that's Walter. I'm over here, but it's, we have this beautiful copy of the Ghost Rockets, which interestingly, Excellent. this this book has a whole lot more to do with my current research than I ever thought I would because, you know, in recent uh, months, I was able to get the FAA to finally admit, yes, they do investigate UFOs. And uh, there is a uh, database online that's called the Aviation Safety Reporting System uh, that a friend of mine at NASA first brought to my attention because NASA maintains that uh, that database. But uh, this book actually talks not only about the classic ghost rockets uh, from Sweden, which were actually ufology before 1947, is which is... 1952? Uh, well, the, 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 it was actually 1946 when the ghost rocket stuff happens. Oh, but, you know, the... But in the book, I lead off with uh, a story of a, of a rocket-like UFO that was seen over um, the state of Alabama in the summer of 1946. So this is, again, a very no BS kind of survey of reports of rocket and missile-like UAP that have been observed since at least 1946 to the present, and which NASA, uh, or actually the FAA, but, you know, is in a database maintained by NASA, still collects information where I found a few uh, similar uh, incidents. So, yes, that will be our prize for this week, ladies and gents. You get to enjoy Wonderful. this copy of the Ghost Rockets. Thank you very much. That's very generous of you. My Mike. pleasure. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, so uh, micro questions, micro answers. Uh, Micah, why do you use the government term UAP rather than UFOs? And as a follow-up, Walter, how do you feel about the usage of one or the other of these phrases? Micah, go. 
Probably because I'm bored. Maybe drunk if, if it's the weekends. <laughs> They don't have to be that micro. Okay, okay, yeah. Well, r really quickly, I use UAP only on occasion, uh, and that in recognition of the fact that in the modern parlance, some people, scientists, you know, military officials prefer to use that term. But i got to be honest with you, I'm a UFO guy. And, uh, again, Alejandro and I have talked about this. My good pal Jason McClellan and I have talked about this. You say UAP and what do people do? What's that? And you say, you know, UFOs. So, again, if you're going to have to tell them it's UFOs at the end of the day, just call them UFOs. Well but last, UFOs. last point, because I look at the history of the topic again, that's really kind of what I like to do is I like to try and analyze the history. The historically recognized term for these things have been UFOs, and I stick with that in keeping with the historically recognized term. Go ahead. Um, I see it as UFOs and UAP is a subset of that. So UFOs are macro, UAP is micro, because uh, to me, UAP refers to something that has been created here on Earth, whether it's known military, known aerospace, or um, uh, unknown source Earth technology. So UFO macro, UAP micro. And we have a question in the chat from Ari. He's not heavy. He's my brother. Uh, anyone hear about the UAP sightings in the Ukraine or Russia theater? You know, I've seen some anecdotal reports uh, and stuff that's pretty sensational from the tabloids. I haven't seen anything, unfortunately, that I would consider to be a very quality source. But again, you know, uh, Mac Maloney is a friend of mine who years ago wrote a book called UFOs in Wartime. And he puts forward the argument that, you know, there, there have been UFO sightings that coincide with, you know, conflicts throughout history. But I would just ask this again, uh, is it so much that UFOs appear during war or is it that as a result of the technologies that are used in war, and especially the case since after you know World War II, we had radar systems and ever increasingly more advanced detection apparatus, uh, is it that we are better at detecting UFOs in battlefield uh, conditions? I would argue the latter rather than the former. Uh, and, and that would be that uh, the, the, the warlike... Uh, well, the, the, the wartime behavior might attract the UFOs. That's the former. Uh, well, yeah, the former would be that interpretation. Again, my interpretation is that technology is used during wartime, and in essence, really, that extends to in peacetime, but during training operations, again, evidenced by the most recent stuff we've been hearing, 2004 Nimitz incident. Uh, my pal Dave Beatty recently actually broke a huge story there at the debrief about another 2004 incident involving the USS Ronald Reagan. If we look at the 2014-2015 instances with the, um, the USS Theodore Roosevelt, again, these are peacetime training operations, but with the equipment, the radar detection equipment, the AppFlare targeting pod, they're detecting this stuff. Whatever these things are, UAPs, again, you know, in that context, I think like what uh, Walter had been saying, those would be like UAP. We're detecting those things during those uh, instances. So maybe it is that those wartime technologies, wherever and whenever they're used, those tend to correlate with the detection of the UAP. Gotcha. I, I think any stories of UAPs, UFOs in that theater at present um, are derived from likely classified military technology. I I I don't see the oh, UAPs. Oh, so you don't think you don't think they're bullshit? I I think to the extent that they might be true, yeah. where they would derive from is technology that's being used militarily. Mm -hmm. Which would that, make that possibly sense. by us to observe what's going right. on. Well, to observe or, you know, again, we've got to be careful here because, you know, the U.S. doesn't want to get into a war, but many already recognize the Ukrainian conflict in some regards as a proxy war. I mean, we just yeah. signed this $40 billion, you know, um, aid to Ukraine bill this too week. Too little, too late. Right. But, you know, we're aiding in that conflict. And so in some and it's obviously in many ways already a proxy war, whether we like it or not. But the, yeah. the thing is, is that if there were other aid that was going on that we didn't want the world to know about, that would be all the reason to use secret technologies in a very covert way so that you can action, you know, you can take actionable, well, actions without yeah. it being obvious. Yeah. But that's entirely speculation. Again, to, to Walter's point. To say that UAP sightings right now, if there's any legitimacy to them, yeah. that's more likely than aliens are watching the battle, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't buy the whole Space Brothers care about um, us having wars and what we're doing with the environment. I that's that's another meme. <laughs> yeah. So let let me ask this: uh, What's next for Micah Hanks? 
Other than being a guest here on every second Wednesday of every month for the next six months, do you have a book planned? Are you playing guitar at any gigs soon now that you're back? What's on your agenda other than the 17 podcasts you do every week? Well, you know, there are the podcasts, <clears throat> but, um, and of course there's the event in Vernal, Utah at the, uh, um, a UFO Disclosure Symposium at the last weekend of this month. I'm not speaking at the SCU conference the following weekend. I'm going as an observer, actually, although um, I have uh, recently kind of started doing some media relations with SCU. They reached out to me, uh, also uh, my colleagues, Kevin Wright and Alejandro Rojas, who's been involved for a long time as a board member. And uh, we're trying to basically play the role of, you know, helping the SCU just, you know, liaison with the public a little bit more because I do think that it's important to have scientists looking at whatever the range of different things that we call UAP may be. Um, that said, uh, I got a gig, uh, let's see here, tomorrow night. I got another one on Saturday. I do that a lot in the summertime. A lot of these are private parties and weddings and things like that where I go and, and I strum a guitar. This in, in the neighborhood of, uh, uh, I was going to say Raleigh, North Carolina, but that's not right. Oh, well, you're close. I'm about four hours from Raleigh. I'm in western North Carolina, so it's around Asheville. Asheville. Absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, uh, I keep talking about uh, getting together with uh, Smokey, my co-host on the Sasquatch Tracks podcast I do. He and I have uh, played music. He, he and I are playing together tomorrow, in fact. We talked about d putting together some kind of a, you know, Sabbath-esque rock band that's all cryptid and, you know, stuff like that. You know, songs about Flatwoods and, and you know, all the classic cool. stories. Wouldn't that be nice. fun? And, and I thought it'd be really cool if we could take that band to some of these conferences and stuff and, and perform, uh, you know, at, at some of these things. So, yeah, you'll probably see me at a lot of conferences throughout the next few months. And I've got two books. Um, well, I've got like four books I'm working on. I'm, I kid you oh, not. Cool. Yeah, but but uh, I have two shorter term projects, which are still as labor intensive with the research. And then there are two real serious historical deep dives that are longer processes. And it's sad. I've had to put a lot of the, the work on those on hold for the last few months and uh, inevitably I'm going to have to kind of clear out my schedule to be able to facilitate time for that you know and that's the whole thing the best thing about the lockdown I mean COVID was hell and I'm so glad we're coming out of it but in, in the early stages of that lockdown when none of us were leaving our houses I was in a playground of scholarly research i got on jstor i know wall street knows what i'm talking about i was on jstor i was digging up articles i was doing research i was buying books on amazon i mean it was it was full-blown research writing yeah. and, and i've talked to other people and i'm sure walter can speak to this who during those early stages if there was one good thing about all that it was like wow the, the world made us slow down and get a book out and, and focus. And, and I, I've really missed that. And I got to find time uh, to get back to that. Go ahead, Walter. <laughs> I was robbed during those first few months because I spent the, the first several months on chemotherapy. Oh God. <laughs> oh, I was, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that first year, 2020, I was just like, like, ah, all the writing that I could have done. If there's done, any but... such thing as a good time to have that, I would, right. I would say that might've been. Maybe so. Yeah. That was the other hand. That was the other side. I, it was the best time. So they were saving my life. So I, you know, so what if I, but you know what? I still managed to get a couple of books out that year. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Year. But um, between Walter and I is Walter actually gets those books completed. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to answer Gil's question here about um, what I'm up to. Um, uh, my son is on a plane to Asheville as we speak. He's going to oh, visit some. Yeah, uh, he's going to visit a friend who's having his bachelor party before a wedding. So, oh um, heck, yeah. But uh, um, did you want me to answer that question, Gil, or about what I'm up to? Actually, uh, uh, my question for you was, what do you have up your sleeve? Connecting the dots on yet another cold case mystery. What, what do you <laughs> have going? I'm on? I'm doing a deep deeper dive on T Towns and Brown currently. Um, I am working with uh, a young young gentleman, Todd Wood. I do a series of books with him, and and we're we're looking at some Empire of the Wheel type related stuff. That's my other book thing. Uh, I I am going to be. I've been asked to speak on a panel at the great big San Diego Comic Con in July. And wow. what's interesting is the subject is UFOs, fact and fiction. Mazel so it's great. going to be really interesting. I'm excited about that because I went to that for years as a professional, as a publisher, but I've never been part of the, the talent, the pros there. So this will be my first time appearing there, and that's in July. But um, 
yeah, I'm I'm doing I'm doing kind of a, a de- uh, I'm I'm returning to my Empire of the Whale research a little bit while at the same time looking deeper at uh, T Towns and Brown, and of course, as people know, I'm working on a film, so. Mm, and it's right. Yes, be, that too. You'll be back here on Into the Fringe. Uh, I guess both of you, right? Mm-hmm. Not necessarily at the same time. Right. Boy, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I I do want to go ahead and uh, bring uh, Gap Stargate on uh, to spin the wheel, and uh, let's go ahead and welcome <coughs> Gap Stargate. Hello. I think the microphone's off. Oh, yeah. yeah. There we can go. You hear me? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? Hello. Yes, yep. sir. I understand okay. you have something you'd like to show us. Yeah. Um, hold on now. I didn't know what to do because I've been on TV before and I don't want to be on camera anymore. <laughs> so here is um, my Mr. Boomer. Get down, my cat. All right. Here's the ninja mod. I am the ninja cardinal sin mod with my cardinal sin mod squad shirt. Cool. Can you can you turn it around like a fashion model? Um, no, because I'm I'm on my phone. I'm a, I, no, no, I'm a I mean, big can boy. You, can you turn around uh, to the camera? You mean in the back of me? No, I don't no, know how to. So that your back is to the camera, like a fashion no. twirl. I'm on my I'm on my phone, so it's kind of hard. Oh, okay, all right, fair enough. So hold on, I do have something to share. Here's the big moment. I'm scared. Okay, hold. Uh, you're scared. How do you turn the phone? Uh, I guess. Can you see that? Mm-hmm. Oh yes. yeah, Terry Lovelace. Here, I'll even make you big. I, I, well, here yeah, we go. There we yeah. go. Other way. Yeah, there Incident there. at, uh, De- Devil's Den. Incident at Devil's Den, a true, uh, uh, true story by Terry Lovelace. Um, I love, not because I'm a mod for Cardinal Sin, but I love the giveaways. And I was so freaking out that I won this last time. Um, and so I highly recommend everybody, not only for the prize, but you get to um, you get to meet guests like Micah and Walter, and then to show you, um, and then he the autographed it for me. Can you nice. see that? Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Oh, nice. Always nice. Yeah. Nice. So I, I was just freaking out, uh, um, Pretty uh, happy freaking that out about that, surprise. and yeah. All right. Yeah, and you know what? I have learned. So, I mean, I was interested in UFOs and that kind of stuff and what's been going on in the world. But when I met Cardinal Sin, I, I was people were recommending channels and PJ from Orville Nation was like, yo, check out Cardinal Sin. And so I'm like, what in the hell is into the fringe? So let me watch it. So <laughs> I watch it and I'm like, holy cow. Wow. Two hours just went by. And I didn't even know it. And, and it you know, again. yeah. And, you know, tonight's episode, you guys are wonderful. It's great to be on here with you guys. And sorry about my camera. And if you hear a cat, it's a black cat. And he just, every time my voice is heightened, he comes and meows and attacks me. So, you, you, so <laughs> okay. you, 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 yeah. But, um, well, we'll, you know, we'll let you get off camera so you can get defend yourself from your black cat yeah but yeah exactly well he, he's i don't know i can sometimes think when i'm sleeping he opens other portals yeah. um I, i'll just say something real quick cardinal last night I, he was on top of me staring at me and when i fell asleep and woke up he was still there but i i use a cpap machine and i smelled floral roses inside my machine but anyway right. so yeah Hmm. so thanks for having me on here everybody go subscribe to everybody on the panel cardinal sin is a great guy and he's got great content thank you all right thanks everybody good night thank you gap stargate good night and now we're going to bring on on to derivative jill 
Hello. Hello, Jill. Hi there. How are you? Just fine. Doing well. It is good to see you. Do good you to have see you your too. wheel ready? Yes. All right. We're going to bring that wheel in. And this always makes me nauseous seeing my head spin. <laughs> it reminds me of the exorcist a little bit, but let's go ahead and give that thing a spin, Jill. Ooh. Perk 130. Hey. Congratulations, Congratulations Herc. Yeah, so, congrats. Uh, here are the instructions for Herc 130. Go ahead and send me your information to gill at sunflower.com. And I will make sure to send it to Micah, who will uh, autograph his Ghost Rockets book and put it in the mail to you. Yes, Herc. Now you have to read my insane ramblings. Klatu Barata Nikto to you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, Jill, thanks very much. We really appreciate you uh, doing the, uh, the spinner wheel. And uh, we'll see you next week. And You're uh, welcome. See next you next time. Week, our guest will be Mike Barra. And there's supposed to be a requisite amount of oohs and ahs to that. But um, I lost my ooh and my ah button, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> It's around here somewhere. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm still fascinated with the uh, aspects of the book he wrote with Hoagland about all the mystical stuff that went on Dark behind mission. the Apollo program. Yeah, we're going to be covering it, that a lot. That oh, good because to me that's the most interesting part of that book. My co-host, uh, one of my co-hosts for that show is going to be a 32nd degree Mason Ooh. who's getting his 33rd degree. Okay. So. Because a lot of the uh, subject matter in Dark Mission has to do with mm -hmm. magicians and masons and Nazis, yeah, he's he's going to be there to sort of ponder over the the Masonic uh, part of that. So yeah, <laughs> that'll definitely be interesting. Um, thanks to both of our guests for being here tonight and for such a fascinating conversation. I'd like to thank my wonderful mods and everyone in the chat for being here. Without you, there would be no show and no channel. And I'd like to announce that my 800 subscriber celebration will be coming up soon. So stay tuned for uh, details on that. Uh, is there anything else that you guys would like to uh, promote or plug or uh, are you good? Yeah, I think we're good. Although I just, yep. uh, will, I'll say it's always a pleasure to see you, Gil, and of course Walter Bosley. Yep. He and I, we, we can't stay out of trouble. So <laughs> that that only makes things <laughs> more interesting. <laughs> That's why I brought you on. Yeah, good times. Very good. All right. Well, thanks again to everybody. And it's uh, by the way, um, if you guys would stick around after the show briefly, I would mm -hmm. appreciate it. For everybody else, it's Cardinal Sin, out.